Friends Podcast. Hi, I'm Diane Hunt. I'm an Impressionist Realist Painter connecting with nature through my brush. I work in oil paint and watercolor and I live in the countryside of Maryland's eastern shore, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. You can find me online at dianehuntstudio.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Diane Hunt Studio. Hi, I'm Constance Brosson of Steve Brosson's Jewelry Designs. I live in Oklahoma on a prairie and I make uh, handmade jewelry in silver, copper, and brass. I'm an artist that paints. I paint pastels and in oil sometimes. Hello, this is Clyde J.K.L. I'm the host of this podcast. I am a emerging representational artist. I do historic rend- renderings, seascapes, landscapes, botanicals, birds, and whatnot. And a tight illustrative hand and watercolor, pen and ink, and acrylic paints. And I live in Oklahoma City. And here it is again. It is Monday, August the 3rd, 2020, and this is the Artist Friends Podcast, episode 57, and my name is Clyde J. Kell, and I am here with my two best artist friends, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson, and hello, Diane. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Constance. Hello, everyone. Hello, Constance. Hi, Clyde. Hi, Diane. Hello, everybody. Welcome. You two, I tell you what, it's so nice that you keep me company here so I don't have such a lonely life, but uh, I look forward <laughs> to these our weekly meetings here so we can discuss art and exchange stories and talk about our gardens and, of course, I don't have a garden, but Constance does, and I guess it's going, it's going crazy. <laughs> We don't record our entire meeting, but let me tell you, some of our off-mic conversations are, are really hilarious. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we would probably uh, bore everybody else, so more likely. All right. The theme for uh, this week, for our listeners, if you go to www.talkartpodcast.com, that's talkartpodcast.com, you see the recommended videos, and I, um, I'm not even going to try to say that word because I'll mess it up, but I I, present, I recommended two videos that give opposite opinions, contrary opinions about artists and about the art world and um, the uh, artist's, uh, artist's careers, which uh, was... Uh, I think, uh, motivational for our discussion. And my rationale for selecting these, or my motivation for selecting these two videos, one video was uh, a web interview, interview that uh, Paul Klein held with Foster Goldstrom, who is a um, art collector, and he had known him for 40-some years, I guess. This was recorded about 2014. I think that was the date. And... Um, the other video was a documentary about the life of Norman Rockwell. And in the art world, these two people have completely different opinions. And I thought it would be interesting to kind of uh, discuss maybe why and uh, a, little bit, a little bit about the, uh, their opinions. What motivated me to select that was this week was my own works of art. I've achieved another or crossed another threshold as I call it 
I would say within the past couple of years or so, as, I, as I've been pursuing this uh, art journey, the production of my art or the quality of it has been about 80% of it has probably been, you would call it decorative, you know, decorative art, um, you know, pretty flowers and things that you want to put on apparel and maybe put on your wall, but not any, I guess, significant. I mean, it's important, but not really significant to where it evokes a, uh, a serious emotion. And I've created some pieces in the past when I thought about it, but uh, like that, but they were happy accidents, which is what I call them. The more I thought about them, like when I uh, did my uh, Doubting Thomas, that was more of a tribute to uh, Caravaggio. And the first time I posted it on social media, immediately the comments were, that's like a Caravaggio. The technique wasn't Caravaggio, but the emotion or the uh, invocation people picked up. And that, that excited me. It wasn't my real intention, but at the time, I had Caravaggio in my mind, I guess, when I was creating it. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. And then I've done a couple pieces uh, that were, I folks have said, were Van Gogh. Of course, I really like Van Gogh's work. They were, you know, not necessarily Van Gogh-like because uh, I don't attempt to paint like these artists. But what I strive for is to uh, represent them or represent the emotion I, that they that their art generates. And so those are those are in the past, those were not all intentional. They were what I call happy accidents. This week, my three pieces of artwork were intentional. So that's how I come, I say I've crossed a new threshold. And how I know they were, they were intentional. I knew in my mind what I was doing and what I was thinking of, but I didn't expect the response that I received. And the response was very positive, but each time I hit the target, bingo. Uh, I did a, uh, for the first time, I, I did a nude. Basically, it's a, uh, a, the backside of a woman in a form of a vase with flowers. And when I showed that to my uh, oldest daughter, I always ran all my art by my daughter. She's my main art critic. And she said, okay, so what? It's, it's a naked lady's butt. <laughs> she didn't catch what I was getting at. It's a very symbolic piece, and I call it a tribute to uh, Persephone that uh, was a piece of artwork that Thomas Hart Benton created you know, back in the 30s. But uh, Ann Farley, who you two know, her comment was, Clyde, this is a very emotional piece. That was it. She hit it. She hit it exactly what I was going for. It's not just the naked vase. It, there's a lot of symbolism in that piece. So then that kind of inspired me. Okay, let's see what else I can do. Well, it's kind of fall, so I want to do some fall-type images. So I started looking through uh, a royalty-free website. Uh, I usually use a pix, pixabay.com for royalty-free images to find a nice, pretty fall image. I came across the reference picture, and I said, wow, that looks like a Thomas Kincaid. That really looks like a Thomas Kincaid image. And, of course, Thomas Kincaid, I like a lot of his art, as my daughters really love his artwork, and uh, millions of people do. So I uh, started to work on it, and when I got done, I reached a certain point. I was sat, stood back, wow, that's Thomas Kincaid. It's not painted in his style, but it gives you that reminder. So I posted that on Facebook. Bingo. Comments like, it's magical. It's uh, one person said, Kincaid is in, he made up a word, you know. Another person said, it's, it's beautiful fantasy. Okay, I did it. Bingo. That's what I, that's what I achieved. I wanted to achieve. Now, the third piece, now, I haven't got that many comments from it because the third piece was really kind of strange. I was 
kind of thinking about uh, when I lived in Naples, Italy, and something that used to, I, I didn't go that often, but when I did go with my uh, wife and uh, mother-in-law to the fish markets, the fish market in Naples, Italy, uh, you got to have a strong stomach because, <laughs> first of all, the smell. Second of all, these markets have been in operation. They've been running these markets, open-air markets, for hundreds of years. Uh, you pick out what you want, and then they butcher it and clean it right there for you. And you take it home in a plastic bag. But what always attracted me, what I enjoyed watching, in fact, I used to kind of stray away from them, was I like to displace because the Italians have this Italian fish, fishermen, you know, the, especially in the large markets, they've got lots and lots of booths and, and set up. And how, how do you distinguish one guy from another, you know, unless you, unless you know them, get to know them, you know. They would have these wonderful displays of exotic, like the image I did, did of a, you know, a large fish with a smaller fish in the mouth hanging out. And, and it'd be all set up with, with fruits and vegetables and, you know, and, and, and then you pick out which one you, which fish you want, they'd have it in a, you know, in a bucket, you know, behind, you know, behind the counter or whatever. So, uh, you know, I got to think I started looking through reference photos. I, I, just, I wanted to do that. So I found a beautiful picture of uh, the, of a fish, the fish market of a display that reminded me of, of them Pasquale, you know, Italy of uh, during that time period. But then it, Recall when I was looking at it, it reminded me of the 17th century Dutch artist uh, Jacob Gilliam. I'm probably mispronouncing his name. He was pretty much known for his painting of fish. Wasn't going to paint it like him because this is pretty grisly. I mean, he has his fish, you know, the blood and the guts. And yeah, <laughs> I didn't want to gross people out, but I wanted to, you know, paint a, a nice display with the uh, chiaroscuro, you know dark and uh, I achieved that because I got a couple comments you know I said that reminds me of the of a 17th century painting okay bingo I did it that's why I say I crossed a threshold with me and Constance we've been enrolled in a professional training course and so I've been really working working with oils quite a bit and really working on improving my craft and these paintings I can I, I think finally reflect that so I've achieved a, a certain level there my point of this it was Whenever you take a course with a coach or when you listen, like if you listen to Foster Ghost, Ghostrum's, you know, conversation, they talk about, you know, what is, what is good art? What is quality art? Artists kind of scratch their head. Like you see a blurb on a canvas. That, what's so good about that? When you got this other guy who can paint a horse that just, has such the loving eyes it started me thinking about you know the uh, what all, all artists try to achieve is a uh, to convey a connection like Diane we've talked about this before making a connection you know with with the viewer so that was my motivation this long-winded talk my motivation <laughs> uh, selecting these these two videos everything so uh Constance and Diane uh, Diane, you want to go first? Uh, first of all, you got a chance to watch the videos, right? I saw the Foster Goals from one, and I <laughs> some of the things he said I didn't particularly agree with, but I I can see where he thinks that way from his viewpoint. I think he's more into um, modern art and uh, abstract thinking and um, that kind of thing, so he's more into that kind of artwork. And he basically said that if the, the difference between fine art and um, illustration was that the fine art made you think more and have, you know, more ideas and stuff. But I don't think, but I think, but his, the art that he likes was not, um, is not necessarily the only kind that does that. Exactly. Uh, that's, in my opinion, <laughs> that's what, yeah, mine too. When when I uh, when I listened to that, you know, and everything, and that's that's what picked me up uh, because as as I was working on these works of art, also I had the conversations of Steve Houston. You know, we watched a video where he talks in the growing of an artist, 
and he was talking about uh, that uh, you would don't necessarily want to uh, close the door. You know, you want to leave something in your artwork that causes people to uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, think a little bit. But here's the thing, the difference. You can tell the Foster Coastroom, ghost room and his people his gener his gener generation and his his society his circle you know they are more into what happened in the 60s and in the 70s the art schools they taught artists it's about me it's about me expressing myself to the viewers about me telling people how i feel about social consciousness and whatever these three pieces that i worked on this week wasn't about me at all it wasn't about me at all it was about i was trying to duplicate i was trying to represent the emotion that these other artists generate with to people when they look you know and so when i took the me out of that equation it worked and I think that's what works with people with people on a, on a, on a different level, and, I, and that's what Norman Rockwell did. He took the me out. Yes, his a lot of his work because he you know he worked as an illustrator, he, so he he had to, had a boss he had to please. You know the editors of uh, the Saturday Evening Post and the, the Boys Life and the other magazines. You know that he uh, submitted his artwork. You know in the twenties and thirties you know, up to the forties, but he still. When you really, really look at it, at his work and everything, he was presenting a narrative, but it was a narrative that most people identified with. It wasn't him. It wasn't the me. You know what I mean? So what do you two think about that? Am I right or am I just thinking too much? <laughs> uh, when I was listening to that, I had a hard time listening to him uh, because – he seemed like a very cavalier had to have, he had sort of a very cavalier attitude about how lucky he was getting into the art market and staying in the art market and making his money in the art market. I thought I would like to see Raffi and Clee listen to that whole program and get their opinion on it. Because I thought to myself that, he was really full of himself. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there was a good bit of that. <laughs> and Klein was right in there with him on it There's about a, being full of themselves. Yeah. And I'm sorry. I, There's a bit. There, there, that, that's my opinion, and everybody's entitled to their opinion. Now, I got some good information from Klein through the program that he presented and we went through. Yeah, because I'm 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 stepping around it. I'm I'm stepping around because because there's there is quite a bit. I'm not going to step around it. I'm going to step right in it. Okay, <laughs> and I just did. Yeah. I think they're both kind of full of themselves because they went there. They were successful at being gallery owners, and they sound sounded kind of you know because they were so successful. They had a bit of an elitist, an elitist attitude. Or they sounded a little snobby about the whole thing. Exactly. You know. You know. And I, I, there was a one particular Raffi and Clee episode that we listened to that pointed us to this one site where you could get a yeah. thing written about your painting if you could not figure out what to say about your painting. <laughs> that. Well, it's not to impress. Maybe we could get them to say that about our paintings if we wanted to, you know. <laughs> I, okay, so I've gotten on my little soapbox, so I'll get off. Okay, that's okay. That's what you know, <laughs> because that you know, it was like Diane didn't want to say it, but I knew she was heading in that direction. You know, she when she Sorry, said. Sorry, yes, I, I I just went there because I think it needed to be said. I always leave it up to Constance to say how it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little more diplomatic. <laughs> well, that's what this show is about, isn't it? Isn't yep. it? yep. Then Norman Rockwell now is all is the opposite. Okay, 
of of uh, what they're they're presenting the image and the 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 uh, uh, the I don't know what's the right word the the uh, uh, direction that they're you know talking about for a career to take. Norman Rockwell was completely different. You know, he went to a lot of us really struggle through life trying to get there. His little thing about the stream or river or whatever go of life going in front of him and him just picking out what he wants and making a success of it and throwing back what he doesn't want. I don't know. It just, his little metaphor didn't really <laughs> set well with me. I mean, I'm sure that has, it worked well for him, but uh, that little metaphor has not worked for me. <laughs> you know, we as artists struggle every day. Every time we step up to the easel, we struggle. We struggle with just to pick up the paintbrush sometimes is a struggle. Just to sit in front of the easel and make yourself paint is a struggle. You know, because you think, well, is this going to turn out? Is it going to turn out? Does everybody think I'm crazy for even painting? You know, it's, it's an everyday, every part of the process, a struggle. Not every piece you know? is a masterpiece, you know. I mean, I was, I was happy. It doesn't have to be a masterpiece. <laughs> but, you know, it's still a struggle to paint because you have all these little voices in your head saying whatever they're saying that to make you stop, stop working to begin with, you know. And it's, it's a fight every day to work. You know, instead of just, hey, let's crawl up in the bed and watch television. The heck with the rest of it. Okay. Or, you know. Okay, with that, let's take let's take a break, and okay. <laughs> we got an important message, and we will be right back. Everyone needs to have a space that they feel relaxed and calm in. Hi, I'm artist Diane Hunt, and I create traditional, realistic oil paintings of nature. I'd love to help you bring the beauty of nature into your home or office. For podcast listeners, I am offering a $25 off coupon, good for the next two weeks. Go to www.dianehuntstudio.com. Use code PODCAST25. Let my paintings of nature help to renew your soul. Welcome back to the podcast. You are listening to the Artist Friends Podcast, episode 57 for August the 3rd, 2020. And I am here with Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. And we're discussing the meaning of art and the meaning of life and the snobs and <laughs> not so snobs and whatnot. Constance just got, got some things off her chest before we went on the break. So let's give Diane a chance to get some things off her chest. Well, um, I was, we were talking about Norman Rockwell, too. And he, his whole outlook on his art was completely different from what um, Foster Goldstrom was talking about. He depicted how he felt life should be and his idealistic ideas of, of life in America, basically. And um, a lot of that stuff he totally made up based on you know, how he had grown up and stuff. So it was, it was interesting hearing about that. I didn't realize he had grown up in New York City. And he seemed like every, he, they were saying he seemed like he had must have grown out, out in the country or you know a small town somewhere <laughs> from his artwork. But um, I thought that that was interesting. Depictions are were more um, realistic and idealistic. He wanted you know certain things to be a certain way, and it was it was kind of the perceived um, idea of what living in America was like at the time. I guess you know what everybody's ideal of American life was. And he was criticized, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the uh, hoity toities in the artwork, you know, they, they didn't accept him. They finally, near the end of his career, he finally made some head headway because he, he did, uh, uh, as the documentary states, uh, near the end of his career, uh, he was actually getting, when we, one of our episodes, we talked about artists getting pigeonholed, you know, to doing one particular style or kind of art. He was getting pigeonholed and doing illustration. Plus, the market for illustrators, you know, had changed. There's television now and everything. And back when he started, 
that was how an artist made a living, the illustrator for the magazines, you know, and, and newspapers and, and whatnot. Yeah, well, being an illustrator is a little bit different than being a fine artist, too. And he struggled with that, like wanting to do something besides the illustration type work. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I've been in that situation, too, where you're, you're doing commercial type work and your your soul's aching to, <laughs> to do your own thing. And it's, it's really, um, it does wear on you after a while. I think that's when I, when I talk about this week, I crossed the threshold. That's what I, I never studied as a commercial artist, but like I said, about 80% of my past art has been very decorative. I call it decorative art. You know, it's uh, not, uh, not particularly fine art, but I, I think I've now reached or I'm on the right path now. It made me think of Norman Rockwell. It made me think of Thomas Kincaid. It made me think of that interview with Voss. Uh, Foster goes from and other interviews with other of the uh, you know art market movers and shakers and uh, the there is a there is a definite divide Kincaid because he not only did he acknowledge that divide he actually encouraged that division so a lot of his criticism he brought on himself intentionally he picked the fight it's interesting. Um, when you, I, I watched a documentary of uh, Thomas Hart Benton, who is one of my art, favorite artists of, uh, of the 30s. And the reason why he was my favorite, because when I was in grade school, I went to the uh, University of Indiana and I first saw his mural. And it was just fantastic. You know, I was just blown away, you know, how big it was and how detailed, you know. And I became a fan of, of, of you know, his work. And then after years later, when I saw his documentary, he did the same thing. He picked a fight. <laughs> he well, I think I think any artist, they you, in order to be able to grow and and um, constantly improve yourself and stuff, you 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 have to um, keep changing what you're doing and trying new things. And when you get pigeonholed into doing a certain style constantly over and over again. <laughs> <Yeah>. ad nauseum <laughs> it it really um kind of depletes that you know that growth so it has to all, be very frustrating to be pigeonholed yeah the one thing the characteristic of all these guys that i uh, you know admire the one important thing that which i myself personally want to achieve aspect of art for everybody not art for just a select few, not art for just the museums, for just the, but the galleries, but the art for everybody. The average person who wants to take the time to look at that art and receives an emotional impact from that art, that's, that's what I'm out to do. And that's what they were out to do, you know? And so when we talked about their careers, you know, getting pigeonholed, whatever, yeah, I definitely don't want to get myself pigeonholed. Maybe that's why I'm bouncing back and forth in between different things. What about you, Diane? What's what's your opinion of of, of that? Or, well, I mean, I worked for a, a licensed artist for a while, and I basically had a paint in her style, and um, I worked in her studio. So uh, a lot of the work I did had to emulate her style, and it it became very difficult for me to switch back to myself when I was working on my own work. And that's one of the reasons I quit there because it was just like, I couldn't, it, I could see it affecting my own work and I didn't want it to be doing that. So it was, I mean, it's like an illustrator, you're working for, you know, working at a deadline and you're, um, t they tell you basically what, what they want so you have to supply them with that instead of doing your own thing. And I can see, like with Norman Rockwell, how that probably was really after. I mean, he did that for so many years. Gosh, he, he did hundreds of paintings for, you know, the market and not necessarily for himself. So I can see where he was really struggling to let his own painter side come out. <laughs> yeah, or his, yeah, his... Uh... You know, some people talk about the the artist's voice. You know, it, it's 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 that, and it's. But once again, it's not so much as the me, because if you notice, even his later work, 
you could identify what he was conveying, but it wasn't something from him, his soul. And you, and until you look at enough of his family, like one of those uh, art historians in the documentary mentioned this, his work, actually, he was criticized that it wasn't fine art, but all of his, from the early days all the way through, is actually fine art when you really look at it with an with a art critic's a clear art critic's mind, you know his the the his shading and his positioning and and you know you could trace it back to that he had he had studied you know like his favorite artist was Rembrandt he studied Rembrandt and he wanted to paint like Rembrandt. But he did, he actually came across, his artwork comes across as powerful as, as Rembrandt, but it's not Rembrandt's style. Now, for me, that's remarkable. And that is what my own personal growth, that is what I am trying to achieve. And I hit that threshold this, this weekend, uh, this last week. And going forward now, I know how to do that, you see. It's like once you achieve something – you don't forget it. You know how, you know, I know how to do it again. <laughs> and uh, it gives a personal, a deep personal satisfaction. But at the same time, when people look at the work, it's not, you know, well, Clyde's trying to say something. No, I'm not. <laughs> not really. I'm trying to inspire. I'm trying to do like what Diane says, connect your brush with nature. <laughs> I still like that phrase. I'm going to steal that from you. <laughs> <Yeah>. Can't have it. <laughs> no, that's hers. you got to make one up on your own. Yeah. <laughs> uh, mine is I like to, um, I like for people to see what I'm thinking. Now you see. I mean, that, that's, that's, I think that only an artist can, I guess writers can let you see what, not really see, but, that you can read what they're thinking, but as an artist, I want you to see what I'm thinking. You know, that's how I let my thoughts come out is through, through painting. The abstracts, I think you can see or even feel what I'm thinking. With abstracts, it's more you can feel what I'm thinking. If I'm feeling upset or I'm feeling happy, these, in an abstract, you can feel it more so. These, but in painting, um, I think you can see what I'm thinking more. This commentary that I'm offering is is is, is me. That's my goal. There's there's uh, you know there's nothing wrong with uh, you know artists who uh, you know create a piece that uh, is a social conscious presents a social conscious uh, narrative or uh, uh, expresses their opinion about something going on in the world. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. But uh, Diane, you going to add something? To that? Well, well, I think everybody has their own thoughts on how they're expressing themselves with their art and what it means to them. So nothing's yeah. right or wrong. It's just, you know, however, what their voice is. What, I mean, yeah. I think I started painting and doing art when I was a kid because I couldn't voice how I was feeling or how I felt about things. And I think a lot of people do that, I, I, but mm -hmm. that's not necessarily a right or wrong way of doing it. Yeah. Um, in the case you know, of so. music or because this is, you know, what they, I guess the word is the creativity or artistic expression, you know, and, and uh, that's what the historians and art educators, you know, would, would, would say that's what it's about. And this is advice for young artists. If you set out to hey, I'm going to create art, get people to buy it. You can. There is art out there. There's a lot of that. There is a lot, like I heard one art critic in a, uh, when he was talking about, uh, I think it was in a documentary of uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas Hart Benton said some of his artwork was just like pure kitsch. He said, you know, just because millions of people, you know, buy art doesn't necessarily mean it's good art. <laughs> and when he said that, I said, what a snob. But then the more I got thinking about, okay, yeah, there are quite a few artists that, you know, hey, they sell we see it all the time, you know. Uh, he's made the most money now. Um, my mind just went blank. He's a modern artist. You two help. Oh, which, <laughs> there's a few of them. Hirsch or... Um, Damien Hirsch. 
the, um, who's the other guy? Uh, Gogoshin or um, Pollock or a uh, live or dead? Who are you talking about? Right, alive. <laughs> he's still alive, and he's like worth so many millions of dollars, uh, almost billion dollars. You know, he does oh, like giant, giant uh, uh, bunny made out of metal and and. Oh, uh, okay. Coons. Coons. Jeff. Coons. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah. Yes. You know, hey, that guy's laughing all the way to the bank. <laughs> Don't <laughs> oh, Whatever. Whatever it takes to get you there. <laughs> Kudos. That's yeah. all I can say. Yeah. What works, whatever works for you. No, and that's not necessary. You know, I wish that the, that art critic, you know, I, I would love to hear his comments about Jeff Coons. You know, it's, it's, it falls into that line. I think of Jeff Coons when he said that, when he made that statement in a documentary, uh, it, uh, it, it reminded me Jeff Coons popped into my head, you know, I said, yeah, that uh, mm-hmm. not necessarily, you know, a, uh, you know, necessarily good art, you know, <laughs> cause it's worth, you know, uh, they was talking about art when him and, uh, Paul Klein were talking about art Basel, you know, a little bit about, a little bit about that, you know, and <laughs> yeah, how one artist would. Minutes. It was almost got sucked into paying for being into Art Basel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got to be careful and pay your dues to figure out whether somebody's taking you or not. Yeah. You know. Yes, that's how that led led to that. You know, because they were talking about there was, I guess, there was just a, uh, a sixty minutes uh, uh, program about Art Basel or something, and they were talking to you know some of the people who were spent a hundred thousand dollars for a piece of artwork that you know the dealers they were saying. You know, I only deal with the, uh, you know, 1% of the 1%, you know. <laughs> so these people don't know anything about art, but they take all my recommendations. I was like, that's so full of crap. <laughs> it is true. It is, you know. And so the, the Jeff Coons and Damien Hurst and, you know, whatnot come, come to my mind when I. Uh, and he was saying that he was offended by that person who was saying that they only deal with the 1% of the 1%. When he had. I thought. And you're being a snob about what what you're doing. <laughs> no, five minutes earlier, he was. So, it it struck me. Yeah. You know, I don't want to jump on you know on, on Foster because I actually enjoyed during our course. We he was one of his recommended videos. I enjoyed. Uh, well, it gives you insight to these gallerists, you know, and, yeah. and he did say that a lot of times when somebody walks into his place, he does take the time to look at their portfolio. Which a lot of people don't, you know. Well, when um, gallery, like he no longer has, you know, has a gallery. Right, but I mean, but when he did, he did t- take the time yeah. to look at their portfolio, which a lot of galleries will not. They will make you have an appointment, and then you have to send them samples of that. Making when you're making the appointment, and then they may not accept your, you know, give you an appointment. So. You know, so to yeah, a, the gallery scene is really kind of rough. Um, well, and I really have not had, I have not even tried to approach in a gallery because you know, you guys both know that, I did, that, uh, what my thing with the galleries are. I did one time whenever, right, right after I, you know, we finished the course, I, I went to a, uh, I took what, uh, what's called an art walk that they have, they have here in, a, in Oklahoma city, uh, you know, first Friday and, uh, God, if Oklahoma city, people listen to this, I probably get upset, but I went to like, I visited five, five or six, you know, different galleries and, you know, and, and everything, the impression I, they weren't rude to me. No, they were very polite and everything, but there was this, what's the word I want to use? There was like a fog in, in the air. It's called getting blown off. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, a, you know, a, because at first they're polite about it, but it's still getting what you call getting blown off. <laughs> when they thought I was like a potential buyer, but when I happened to say I was an artist, it was like okay. I mean, one lady literally turned her back on me. Whoa, okay. <laughs> well, the thing about it is, is you're, it's like you're a salesman, okay? Um, it's consider yourself a va- like being a vacuum cleaner salesperson. How many doors do you have to knock on before somebody will let you in and let you at least even demonstrate the vacuum cleaner, much less sell one? Exactly. If you want to blow the gas. So that's that's the whole deal. I mean, I sold Avon for years, and there's going to be at least 10 
to 20 people who slam the door in your face and say, I don't use Avon. I'm going, you don't even wash your hair. <laughs> but still, you know, that's the point. Um, the odds are 10 to 15 galleries are going to slam the door in your face when you walk in. Right. That's just how it is. You know, and then. Whenever I, I was motivated. I, once you get down that list of odds, finally somebody's going to say, oh, okay, let me look at your portfolio. portfolio. You know, so that's how that, that's just how it goes. To, you know? to uh, see what it was all about. And I wasn't even, didn't have any of my artwork. It wasn't even about to show any of my, I was just the, you know, the step of establishing relationship, you know, whatever that, that was the, uh, you know, the goal or just to, I, you know, just to see. And I really, it, I really was turned off completely. I was just turned off. I did meet some good artists though. And I kept in contact with, you know, with them and they're following me on Facebook and I follow them, you know? And well, uh, I think, I think the and mistake that you made was that you approached them during an event. When, yeah. when you're approaching galleries, you need to make, well, if you, if you don't make an appointment, if you're just going into the gallery, you need to do it when they're not having an event because right. they're there to find somebody to buy the paintings that they have displayed. And that's their job at, the, at that time. So it's like you, you know, you're kind of interrupting that if you're right. an artist right. and you go into it. So, and they're exhausted from getting set up for that event. Yeah. And so you're better off going you know, in between events or at a time than they are not doing that. They're both, they're both slapping me now. They're both jumping. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, because it's, and if you didn't learn anything else from Klein's <laughs> artist works, that was one of the first things he told you, you, you go in for the dates and the, in the, you know, during the, that was the first one he says don't approach them for a anything except for to say hi my name is so and so what a wonderful show thank you great and walk out don't hand them a business card during the show nothing just say great show loved it yeah. boom walk out yeah. my name is such and such and walk out interesting <laughs> Now, since that time, like I said, that was a good almost three years ago. What mm -hmm. What is interesting is I have been able to accomplish that through the Internet, through, you know, and I've established relationships with galleries through the, through the Internet, you know, and, and so, so this has, has, you know, which is my forte, you know, that was my forte anyhow, you know, and being behind this wall, you know, and now... <laughs> COVID-19 crisis has been going on. That's become the standard now. So I feel rather, rather good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. On that note, uh, let's wrap this long winded episode up. <laughs> we, we haven't uh, bored any of our listeners and our non-artist listeners. And yeah, I got slapped by both Constance and <laughs> Diane on this. <laughs> no, I think I think that's a common mistake, though, that a lot of artists do make, especially yeah. when they're starting out, that they approach the galleries at the wrong time, and in, in the wrong way, and you know, then they get discouraged and give up. So I think you know you have to think about it from their perspective and look at it from the other side. Like you know, if you were working, would you want somebody coming in and interrupting you? So it's, it's, you know, it's something you need to learn as a new artist, just yep. the way it is. <laughs> I, Will has been with me several times. We, generally, when we go to an art place like that, and if they're having a reception or a show or whatever, I have to be very careful with Will. He is the world's worst about talking about my <laughs> art and me to anybody. <laughs> Constance, you know, you know. Then I have to almost kick him in the shins when he starts up <laughs> because I'm going, this is not the time or place to do this. <laughs> Am I going to have to? We can come back later when they're not having a show, but don't start doing this right now because this is rule number one, do not do. <laughs> you just say, you go shake their hand, find the guys who do, who's having the show, you shake their hand, you 
announce yourself and say, very good show, and then bow out and leave, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell them I'm an artist or anything else. Just say, hey, great show, loved it, <laughs> and leave. <laughs> Hey, listeners, uh, Constance forgot that this is a, we have an international audience there. So, uh, Will's going to be famous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to say that. <laughs> okay, let's wrap this episode up. That's a good note to wrap it up on, okay? For our listeners, you have been listening to the Artist Friends Podcast, episode 57 for August the 3rd, 2020, and we've been chatting uh, with uh, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson and I am going to say goodbye to Diane and Constance bye bye you two good night Clyde, good night Constance good night everyone good night Clyde, good night Diane good night everybody good night folks and thank you so much for listening hey give us a thumbs up or give us a star rating however you, you hear this podcast please we appreciate that give us some love, bye bye The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde J. Kale. Participating artists, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson and Clyde J. Kale. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Constance Bronson at www.etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash C-B-R-O-S-N-A-N-S. Clyde J. Kale at www.cjkaleartworks.com. If you would like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends Podcast, please email cjkale at sign mystery-otr.com. If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a thumbs up or star rating. And most of all, send us your comments. This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons license.